Hi, Blessing. Hi, Gerald. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Thank you for jumping on this with me. I really appreciate it. Happy. <laughs> My pleasure. Awesome, awesome. So let's dive right into it, right? So I would like to start with, you know, just for the benefit of those who don't really know who Blessing is, right? So I would like you to introduce yourself, right? So who is Blessing Abeng? And how do you, you know, normally introduce yourself to people? Like, what do you want people to know you as and know you for? Okay. Um, normally, how I would introduce myself is, Hi, my name is Blessing Abeng. And depending on where I'm speaking, it would either be co-founder of Ingressive for Good or content creator, but most importantly, <laughs> writing and communications professional. Um, and really, in everything, I'm just a writing and communication professional. And what that just means is that I help people find what is unique about them, and I help them communicate that identity to their target audience, be it their clients, their customers, their you know investors, your stakeholders in general. But beyond all of that, I'm a girl who likes enjoyment, and that's what I want to be remembered. Ah, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Effectively trying to leave people better than I meet them. Awesome. Awesome. That's really lovely. All right. So you mentioned um, Ingressive for Good, right? And um, I would just like to know what's Ingressive about. You know, what problems are you guys trying to solve out there? Ingressive for Good. Question. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great question. I know Ingressive Capital is the popular one. The venture yes, the, exactly. Somehow. I don't know how we're becoming more popular. Everyone's just like, oh, we got so good. But I'll tell you the story. So when you meet founders, um, they all think that the biggest problem that they have is money. But once they get the money, they realize, oops, money is not the big problem. Hiring talent is a big and a serious problem, right? And so that has become something that we're well aware of. But it's not that people don't want to be the talent that you know, founders would hire. It's just that they don't have the resources or the tools to learn the skills that they need, you know, to be the tech talent that founders need. And this is not surprising because not a lot of people live above a dollar a day. Um, the poverty levels are high mm. in Africa, especially. And so we, we knew these things. And then we also checked some data, right? We realized someone who goes into, if two people graduate now and one person decides to go into tech and the other person goes into banking chances that the person who is working in tech will be any two times to five times more than the person who is in the banking um same same yeah. entry level um levels right and then we also realize that if you give someone tech training three months six months they can learn the basics that they need and then just have to spend a lifetime practicing and perfecting, maybe through internships, you know, working on projects and stuff, perfecting what they've learned to build their skills. And so we decided, how can we add all of these things together and offer something to people in a way that they would be able to leverage those opportunities for free? The biggest problem people have is access. The difference between person A and person B is access. And so what if we could just democratize that access? That's really what's investing for good is doing. So we're increasing the earning power of African youth by empowering them with the tech skills that they need and connecting them to jobs. And all in all, we're just democratizing access, right? And making it easier for people to transition into tech. Oh, wow. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. And, and, and um... Let me give you the numbers. So, so far, we've trained over 150. <laughs> Okay. We use a community of over 250,000 people across many African countries, actually. We are present in... Oh, not just Nigeria. No, not just Nigeria. We're present in over 100 countries because we're wow. serving Africans. Right? So because we're serving Africans specifically, we're also serving Africans who are in other countries. Just being emotionally sensitive to the fact that a lot of Nigerians and Africans are traveling abroad to learn. Some of them are doing that on scholarship. It doesn't mean that they have financial you know, support or that they're financially fine. So being able to support those people to learn the tech skills that they need, that has also been really, really great. Oh, okay. That was really great to hear. Keep up the good work. Awesome. Awesome. So um, I know you've done a couple of things prior to Ingressive for Good, right? I am, you were co-founder at Disha, you know, and a couple other things, right? So I'm just curious, right? Can you, you know, like give us some, you know, let's just go back a bit and get some I backstory. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of things um so i've worked at an agency and i've also worked with like global international brands national brands i've worked across industries banking sectors like still doing branding and communications but i've done it for banks for um 
brands in Nigeria and outside of Nigeria, done dark and lovely Africa, done for head, um, I think health health brands as well. There's a period we worked on GSK. There's a period I worked with Dark and Lovely Africa. You know, we just like across wow. different managed MTM project fame. Um that comes from MTM project fame at some point. There's just like different activities that we've done over time. Um, I've also been the co-director of Startup Grind Lagos. Uh, where we built the community to, to over 10,000 entrepreneurs in Lagos with gathering entrepreneurs. Um, wow. Entrepreneurs wow. Yeah, I've done a lot of things. <laughs> wow, really impressive. As well. I still do that. I'm um, great content. There was a period where I hosted um, Seth Godin, um, had conversations with international people who have made impacts across the world, just sort of building community and all of that. So my work is strong. Okay, so I, I know um, Disha got acquired at some point, right? I mean, really exciting stuff by Florida Wave, right? And just curious, can you tell me the series of activities that led to that acquisition? And was it really good? I mean, it was really great that we eventually got acquired. I, I remember, so funny story is, you remember I said I was a co-director of Startup Grind Lagos. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that happened there was, that was even where I got to meet Maya, who was the founder and brain behind Invested for Good. That's where I got to meet Evans, because we invited them to come, come uh -huh. have a Met Chris Kwekowe, you know, all of these relationships sort of fostered during my time. Yeah. Helping connect people to their potential co-founders just by being in the community of people to potential investor. It was really, really interesting, right? And so, yeah, we met, um, I met Evans and then, you know, Evans' encounter with me from there, Ev um, he, the founder of Disha and the other co-founder, Rufus, just sort of knew each other for a while. I also knew when they started working on Disha and I really, really loved the product. And then one day they just reached out to me. I think I just come back from San Francisco after a speaking event. I was invited to speak at Silicon Valley. So they just called me up and they were like, oh, hey, blessing. Um, we, we are, we're building this product. You already know about the product. You've already been part of some of our review systems and everything. Um, we've been stuck at growth for a bit. We've had just about over a thousand people on the platform. We've barely had any revenue. And we think that if there's anyone who can help us sort of, you know, increase marketing. Yeah. We really cool. It would be you. So I was like, oh, okay, cool. So I was brought in as a co-founder and a CMO, which is really interesting because and they made the right choice, right? Because right out, out of that moment, month on month, we started to have a hundred percent increase in you know new users. We had increase in revenue as well. I think our revenue mm. shot up by a thousand percent. Wow. Uh, wow. Massive. We had I know the growth was phew, <laughs> Real quick, uh, we had um, 20,000 users by the time um, Flutterwave was acquiring. We had great community. The community of creators and the support was so amazing. I ever feel like it was the community that brought Flutterwave's attention towards us, right? Yeah. And, I, and I, I really am a big advocate for, you know, different types of exits. It's okay to have mergers and acquisitions. And how True. I saw the acquisition, was True. they helped us achieve goals that we had so much, so much faster. Like it, it was more exponential things that we had yeah. done. We had a level where they could take it up and then just multiply our efforts. So that was really, really great. And I know you have an acquisition yourself, so you must reply. Yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> last year, that was last year. Yeah. Congratulations. I know, I <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so let, let's get right into it, right? Because one of the things I like to do at back end you know, is interrogate some of the challenges that um, people seem to experience while building, right? And I'm sure you've had your fair share as well. So do you mind sharing some of those, you know, really grueling challenges that you've had and how were you able to navigate your way around them? I'm even trying to think, in my head, I'm like, which one? You know, like, you so <laughs> there are so many, <laughs> as a founder, <laughs> as a leader, <laughs> so many, I yeah. Being like the the third founder, the founder that they always bring on. So I'm not the founder who starts in the beginning. I might be a founding member, but maybe you, you get to love me so much. You're not be like, ah, oh, you're doing the work so much. Come, you're now co-founder, you know. And that's really interesting because you get to see different perspectives of the business. 
um, for Ingressive for Good, for example, I was one of the founding members. And we started in the thick of COVID. Mm. And during that COVID period, people were more interested in, you know, funding fintech, I'm sorry, funding he- health techs, funding health companies in general, yeah. which means, because we needed to get out of COVID, um, people were going insane being locked down, right? And so we needed to get out of COVID. We needed the vaccines. We needed all of those health um, solutions really, really fast. There were also other people who took it upon themselves to fund, you know, providing foods and food and money and things to just help people who couldn't come out to do their daily jobs to help make ends meet. So people were getting yeah. laid off. It was really crazy. It was a crazy time, right? So those things obviously took priority. However, we as a nonprofit, remember, stock market was falling, everything was scattering, people were losing money at some point. And so at that time, there was so much uncertainty. People weren't giving nonprofits money like that, so except you were a nonprofit yeah. you were moving a property. For health, right? And even people are not giving for profits money in the beginning like that as well, because it was also like there is so much uncertainty. There's exactly. So much uncertainty exactly. Finance. There's a lot well, to do with. And- exactly. So eventually, we decided, you know, we're going to do a pilot program. We need to prove to people that this thing we're doing, this is such a great opportunity. There's so many people getting laid off. There's so many people, you know, stuck. We need to prove to people that this is something people need. This might be the pivoting point. And especially with the way tech is going, this might be the turnaround point for Africans. So let's do something. So we took a, like it did a whole strategy session for six months. We agreed on what our goals would be. We're like, we're going to have a community of 10,000 people. We're going to train 5,000 people. Actually, no, we said we're even going to train 2,500 people. And then we just had like all these goals that we wanted to just doing that time we didn't know how we're going to do it there was not a dime there was no dollar not one naira in the bank so we took that pilot goal and we went and we pitched to the only man who believed in us at that time he was like mm, you guys have a good idea i'm going to give you money for to pay salaries and stuff so you can prove that this is something that is necessary right and so he he offered to cover i think our salaries for about six months the six months of the pilots pilot program so that's where we started oh, wow. for us, we got a part for sarah for sarah and it, we took it like with our life and blood because there's something i always say when you don't have money you have to be creative yeah and it's creativity that is going to amplify any kind of noise that you're going to be making at that time so we took that we took it as a challenge we were very serious about it and we went ahead and we 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 delivered. We thought we would. We, we didn't even know how we would get the two thousand five hundred people on the Coursera platform at the time when we had the Coursera I for Coursera scholarship. Um, we were so shocked. Ten thousand people, over ten thousand people applied. We got five thousand people wow. on the platform. Those wow! Were serious. We wow! Added new people. It was so massive. One of the people who took the courses is currently a product manager at Kuda Business. He's doing amazing. Like. We are seeing the success stories of people who leverage the platform. We, and it was such a turning point for the nonprofit as well, because now people started chasing us to give us money. We even got a donation from Alphabet, that's Google's company. Um, it was $250,000, I think, and they were able to back us. So, of course, money was a big problem, but we had to innovate around it and figure out how can we use the resources that we have to prove that this is something that needs to be done. When people see the results, they would always, you know, fall in line and so they did it worked and you know now we're i4g we're now impacting hundred thousand people and i'm like oh one hundred fifty thousand people like, yes that, that that's great that's great you know so i'm i'm going to mention something that's going to take you by surprise right um and still speaking about challenges right so i remember you once tweeted that you're going to try working with a friend one last time right <laughs> you didn't see that coming oh I, you didn't see that coming i met Exactly. Yeah. So I just wanted to, you know, my questions would be around finding the right team, the right um, founders or co-founding team to work with. How have you been able to navigate around? Because people have terrible experiences, you know, and, you know, okay. yeah. We said that, right? It was even more from a vendor perspective. Aha. Uh-huh. Um, okay. I've got, <laughs> I've got a lot of questions about it, to be honest. So I need to pay more attention to what I say. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so it was more in, I think it related more towards, you know, 
vendor relationships. What's really interesting is at my wedding, one of the most interesting things that happened for my wedding was I was very, very deliberate. Everyone was talking about, you know, my minimalist wedding that has, you know, sold a ton of copies and has been put back wow. in places. One of the interesting things about that was almost every single vendor, almost every single person who did anything for that wedding were all my friends. Oh, oh it was beautiful. Everything was beautiful, it was perfect. However, I realized that when it comes to business sometimes, when I'm working with my friends, I sometimes in the past have forgotten boundaries and mm -hmm. I have been born just also having to navigate relationships with my friends yeah. and then realize like business, yeah. so this one like we're friends. So yes, at what point do you draw that line? At what, how do you identify that boundary? So the first thing I will tell everyone is please always have a contract whether they're your friends or uh -huh. not. Um, it's so important, right? Because it's so easy to make excuses for your friends. And your friends also somehow low-key have the expectation that you're going to be understanding because you're their friend. And they're always going to keep saying, well, we're friends. You're supposed to understand mm. things like that, which is true. And a lot of times we would make excuses. So key things that I am now doing is, of course, for sure, contracts first. Um, but next thing is I'm also learning to delegate and ensure that other members of my team are leading on those projects that you know someone else is handling so good thing is we just had a conference in i think hackfest hackfest was november november 2022 yes hackfest and it was a great thing because like, this year everyone was my friend. yeah this year the, um, some vendors were like some people some of the people for example photographer now one of the photographers said so they were my friends like the company was from my friend and we agreed on a price very professionally we delivered everything was done very professionally everybody knew exactly what they were supposed to do other members were responsible for chasing them like all of this kind of thing so just like knowing how to communicate expectations way ahead really really helps but also having a contract really really helps having clear boundaries so like, that you can have meetings without sort of knowing that this moment we're friends but this moment we're, 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 we're partners or something like that that really really goes a long way to um, right. Same thing for like even my colleagues that I've worked with that are my personal friends as well. So not I didn't hire them. Let's say my colleagues that I'm working with, I'm to develop a friendship. Yeah. We also need to have that. I, I and I think people underestimate the power of conversations. People need to learn how to have more honest conversations. Say, True. Hey, this is what True. True. Especially if you know that the work that you're doing is going to affect other people, or you know you are the you have a deliverable that is going to impact someone else. So people need you to do stuff. So just like be responsible, communicate, 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 over communicate if you have to, and be clear in your communication and don't assume the worst. Yeah. Anymore. I guess those are the key. Things. So it's safe to say you're a very successful person, right? At least in the few things that you've done over the course of your life. That's what people have been <laughs> like, oh, so, so my question is. <laughs> but it's true it's true like it's true it's, it's obviously true right and my question you know following up, up with that would be how do you stay focused you know disciplined till you literally hit the nail on the head right well i'm a very goal-oriented person and i'm also process oriented which is a very good mix and i'm grateful that i have that um, it can be draining and the result has often been burnout, which I now had to fix in 2022. I asked myself if I die, if I heard from anyone that I was going to die in three months time or in one month's time, what are key things about my life that I would change? Mm -hmm. And so now that mindset has been really helpful because every time I think about it, I'm like, okay, so if I was going to change this thing, if I knew I would die in one month, why am I not changing mm -hmm. it already? Mm -hmm. So key things like that really helped me fight. If I and I and I say something as well that guides me. If I complain about something too much, I had to I, I take a moment to pause and ask myself, can I change it? If I can, then I change it. If I can't, then I remove myself from the environment. If it's not an environment that I can remove myself from, then I, you know, question my intentions and question, you know, why am I still here? What what are the things that I can live with? How can I focus on the things that I have control over? You know, key things like that have been able to help me because a lot of things that yeah your mindset right the other aspect of it is just knowing that i, I redefine failure for myself 
I'm such an experimenter. God, I love to experiment. And so one of the things that I've been saying a lot, and I, I say to whoever a lot, and I found myself now saying it in a lot of interviews, is that the goal with my background as a science student, right, the goal of an experiment is not to be right, but to discover. And so if the, when you go into an experiment, mm. your, your goal is mm. not to say, oh, confirm you are testing and so by testing you might actually get what you postulated or you might get something else and if you get something else you don't just cry yeah. and give up on life you then say this other thing could there be something there why you know you question it and you dig deeper and so when you begin to see life from that perspective it changes your definition of what failure is because truly nobody really knows what they're doing for sure and all of us we're just testing things and seeing what works True. what doesn't work this life is a whole process experimentation and so that's how i've ex I've embraced it and i am i'm living life that way consistently experimenting testing things out and then the things that work over and over again i I'm yeah people and documenting so documenting my process i can now create repeatable success to a good extent and then when i can't recreate my success i'm like okay what do i have to learn from here what is you know what has changed what yeah. are changing all of that and constantly learning taking risks experimenting failing a lot, a whole lot, but I'm also trying my possible best to live life in between. And the last thing is, no matter what happens in life, I've learned that you're not going to take the money that you're making on earth to when you die. True. Yeah, you're not taking to your grave. True. So there has to be a bigger meaning to life than just money. And so I've asked myself, what is that? And what one answer I have found for myself is contribution. I realized exactly. I just before just that. before you conclude, I was good. My next question was going to be, what has been the most rewarding thing for you? And I and I think you're already answering that. Yeah. So go say, ahead. Go ahead. Exactly. Right? So I, I found that you know if Charles Babbage never made abacus or came across the concept of abacus or invented whatever the concept of abacus was, Steve Jobs probably wouldn't have had the chance to eat in the mark. Right, just like the, the the generation from how we went from abacus to supercomputers to computers to laptops and everything is because different people were consistently contributing. Someone had to invent the internet for us to have social media, and it's just in all of that contribution process. You are not, you may not be the one who changes the world, but maybe a discovery that you made will help someone else get a bit further. It's like you give them a head start because of the little that you did, whether you feel like you succeeded at it or not. And so I feel like by contributing, you're giving people heads down. Yeah. So that's something that stays, is evolving the world. And that has been my biggest thing, right? Just leaving people better than I meet them, making the world just a little bit better with the little power of yeah. control that I have, no matter how cool that is. And so that has been the most rewarding thing for me, I guess. And that has also helped me in like, building my own career and my own life. Awesome. So I, I have one final question, but before I ask that question, right, just listening to you and hearing you say all that you've said, very impressive stuff, massive stuff. Um, one thing that keeps ringing in my head is what was your background like growing up, right? And what part of your childhood prepared you for all of this? Because you have a lot going on, right? And you've achieved a lot at a very young age. Yeah. So what part of growing up prepared you for all of this? So my childhood did not prepare, like that's the question. What part of my childhood did not prepare me for this? Because it, it was really interesting. <laughs> yeah. I was going to be a medical doctor, right? And the reason I wanted to be a medical doctor was because my dad had a, a health thing and it was a doctor that saved his life. And I just kept saying, Oh my god, I want to be able to save someone else's life as well. And oh, wow. my, dad, my dad was so happy okay. with Africa be happy and that's story my father told me that this is what happened so i want to believe that truly truly that's what happened and that wasn't his idea that yeah I, was I just want to believe that that's true so he, he he kept saying you know that i i always wanted to be a medical doctor and so we would my parents bought me lab coats i had like toys medical toys i was crazy about being a medical doctor i watched movies about being a medical doctor i read books ben carson's book what mm. uh, but along the line i interned so first, I, I went into Covenant University doing biochemistry because my, my family sort of felt like um, I was too young to go abroad to study medicine. So it would make sense to do a paramedical yeah. course, which became biochemistry. When I did that, um, I went for internship. I did the plants, I, like did phytology in my internship, and I did um, virology as well. 
phyto, yeah, phyto medicine rather, and then virology. And it wasn't really, it wasn't a sweet experience. Like it was nice, but I never had, like the part of it that I never really got to deal with. I was like, oh wow, am I really sure that this is what I want to do? There has to be other ways to save people's lives um, without being the one personally responsible for their lives. Do you know what I mean? Like, and, and I began to explore. That was when I came back to school. I found that I really loved business. My dad is a businessman. My mom is a businesswoman at heart, and she's also an accountant and, and a civil servant. But she, she had business sense, do you know what I mean? And my dad was a yeah. businessman. He yeah, he he made a lot of things, like he did things for himself, which was really interesting. And so was, those things were things that laid foundations for me. I also remember that he forced me to read. Well, he didn't force me, but he, he sort of made sure I read Wish Dad, Poor Dad early on. And I read a couple of books early on. So I, and I also used to read books that my mates were not reading at that time. So my brain really developed really quickly. And the kind of things that I watched, the things that I was surrounded by, the questions that I asked, the fact that I was even allowed to ask questions sometimes, or most times, I was allowed to participate in arguments. Um, that was also really helpful for my yeah. development as well. And so, so I, I ended up loving business somehow. And then I came back to school one day, there was a project in the club that I joined where we were supposed to write a proposal and a business plan. I wrote it. I loved the process. I was really particularly, everybody loved my marketing plan. And then a friend said to me, people started paying me to write business plans, by the way. And I was self-taught. So people started wow. paying me to write business plans. Wow. And then wow. told me to love your business plans because wow. of the marketing side of things. And I'm like, okay, so cool. And then a friend then tells me, blessing, you should totally check out Orange Academy. They do something called branding there. You might like it. It's a good mix of business and marketing. Uh -huh. Check it out. I did. I went to school. I ended up, you know, doing what I needed to do. I learned. I, I learned really hard. I implemented what I learned in a startup at that time. Took it from the startup, went to an agency, and it just became a whole thing. You know, just ripple effect activity. But it was such a fun experience. I also really um, learned independence very early. There's a moment in my life where I moved from my dad's house and I went, I lived alone in the East. And, you know, from there I moved my bags and said, I'm going straight from the East. <laughs> and I had to negotiate with my parents. Even with my father, that if I don't make it, when I get to live, I'll be back to home. Let me do wow. the job that, you know. And so that was really interesting. I really had a very interesting background. I made my first million when I was in university. I, I wrote and published a book. So I just had always challenged myself to do things, to try things, to and giving myself sometimes, giving myself the permission to fail. Doesn't mean I don't cry. I cry sometimes when I don't succeed. That's key. But then I'm, yeah. as I said, I'm redefined. Awesome. Good. Awesome. Awesome. So final question for you. You know, looking at our ecosystem today, Nigeria, Africa, there are a lot of emerging founders, right? And um, what would you say you would rather have these emerging founders do differently, right? So what would what is your own model today, you know, model for a successful, for building a successful startup, right? Exactly. Yeah. Oh, wow. Hmm. I would, I would not say this is a model because as I said, everything everybody's doing is an experiment. So I, this is not a model. But if I were to build another startup again, key thing that I would pay attention to is I would, hire competent people who are passionate and crazy about the mission mm. and vision that is always a game changer it works it works it works like don't hire people just out of emotions or hire people out of you know just pure logic mm. just have mm. a good mix of the two people who are crazy about it who are competent enough to go through and do what they need to do to get it done um i would also yeah i would also really ask a lot of questions and develop great relationships because no matter what you do, life is a relationship. Pool. Like it's just a pool of relationships. Every prayer that you're praying, you're just one person away from getting it as a prayer. Like a prayer answer, right? So you just need to know the right person. I've learned that life is about access, 
and access is not a democracy yet. And that's even why investing for good exists, right? So we're trying to democratize that access. It's like, okay, this access exists. How can we sort of distill that to everyone else? How can we make this more accessible? Let more people have access to it. It's not easy. So when we find a relationship and we're like, oh, we know Google. How can we get Google to support you so that you can also get the things that you want in your life, right? Mm-hmm. It's because one person was able to know Google. Yeah. With that support to so the organization. Everything you need is like a person away. So really, really nurture relationship. Don't just network. Mm-hmm. We just keep networking and mm-hmm. networking for memorable, right? You don't want to just network for networking. True. Huge relationships. True. Nurture the relationships. Don't just collect cards. Follow up. Develop a human relationship. Shout to your friends out. Support people. You don't know where they're going to be tomorrow. And don't do it because you don't know where they're going to exactly. be tomorrow. Exactly. Exactly. Because, you know, that's what you also expect. You know, celebrate people. Be there for them. And just be a kind human being, right? And also just keep your focus. Know what exactly your goals are. Know how you're going to get there. Document your process so that you can create repeatable success. Be, be like just those are tiny things that I really care about, to be honest. And even while you're raising money, pay attention to the fact that overcapitalization exists. Not every money is good money. Just always align with people who understand your vision and you know align yeah. with that vision. And in the spirit of co founding relationships be very clear about what everybody's responsibilities are relationships that have succeeded always have that going for them everybody knows their responsibilities but everybody's also focused on the goal the goal that is bigger than just you right at that point when you can focus on the goal that is bigger than just you ego goes out the window um all those extra things go out the window they become non-issues because we're focused on the customers that we're serving Mm -hmm. and helping them do this and helping them do that so we put our pride aside and figure out how can we make this work. You know, it's always about the work. It's always about the mission. Don't, you know, just make that clear. Always communicate. Communicate with your team. Communicate with your founders. Communicate with anybody that you need to communicate with just so that they understand the direction. And don't be scared to say when you're wrong. Take responsibility. Be transparent. Be accountable. Those are things that I think I would do if I were starting a new start. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for taking our time out of your very no busy schedule to jump on back end. It's really, really, really appreciated.